Support for today's podcast comes from Helix. A few weeks ago, I shared that my husband and I had been searching for our perfect mattress to no avail when serendipity afforded us the opportunity to try a Helix mattress. Well, it's been about six weeks now, and I am still loving the sleep I'm getting on this mattress. The thing I loved most about the ordering process was that we were able to take a two-minute quiz that matches your body type and sleep preference to the perfect mattress for you. Ordering was very easy, and delivery was super fast. If you're looking for an upgrade to the way you sleep, I'd encourage you to check out Helix for a mattress shipped straight to your door with free, no-contact delivery, completely free returns, and a 100-night sleep trial. And just for y'all, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash therapy for black girls. Just go to helixsleep.com slash therapy for black girls, take their two minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Now let's get into the show. Welcome to the Therapy for Black Girls podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 156 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. Today, our favorite friendship researcher, Dr. Marissa Franco, is back to discuss how to manage loneliness. If you missed Dr. Franco's earlier episode about making friends as an adult, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to her. Dr. Marissa G. Franco graduated with her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Maryland in 2017. She's a licensed psychologist in the state of Maryland and an expert on the topic of friendship. She is currently writing a book on how to make friends as an adult, Platonic, which is represented by Avita's Creative Management. She also writes about friendship for Psychology Today and has been a featured expert on friendship for major publications like the New York Times, The Telegraph, and Bustle. Dr. Franco and I chatted about the three different types of loneliness, how to tell if we're struggling with loneliness, and tips for overcoming. If you hear something while listening that resonates with you, please be sure to share it with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. Here's our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us again, Dr. Franco. Sure. Excited to be back. Thanks for the opportunity, Dr. Joy. Of course. Anytime. (laughs) So I'm glad that you're back with us today. And if you missed Dr. Franco's first episode about making friends as an adult, then you definitely want to go back and check that one out because it is an always timely conversation. But even more timely today, talking about loneliness as we are continuing through this pandemic. So can you share a little bit about maybe some of your impressions, Dr. Franco, of things maybe you've heard? from community or, you know, just kind of, you know, people sharing online and stuff? Yeah, I mean, this is clearly a really lonely time. And I think the struggle of the loneliness now is that I don't think you can necessarily overcome this level of loneliness with all of us not seeing each other. And I think, you know, particularly for single folks, but also for like people in relationships as well, because According to the research, there's actually three different types of loneliness. One is called like intimate loneliness, where you feel like you crave those very close intimate connections, like a relationship partner or like a best friend. And then there's relational loneliness. And that's just like craving like those close relationships that are right above the intimate sphere, like general friends or your coworkers or people you feel kind of close to. And then there's your sense of communal loneliness, which is your sense of loneliness for a larger community that's connected to some type of purpose. 
And I think it's really important to keep these different types of loneliness in mind because even those of us who are quarantined with roommates or with a romantic partner, with our families, we can still feel lonely because any of those aspects of loneliness can make us feel lonely. And also feeling like we don't have connections to our larger sense of community. And so I think right now loneliness is showing up in many different ways for people. But I think that like at a time like this, none of us is really immune to it. Hmm. And I think it's interesting that you've identified like three different types because you're saying like at any moment, one of those could be difficult. And I think for a lot of people, we're struggling with all three. Yeah, a lot of us are struggling with all three. I mean, I think the communal loneliness relates to that like larger sense of purpose. And I think that feels really hard when there's so much panic and there's so much stress and we also can't come together in larger communities with people. So you're right. Like you can be sort of um, bombarded with all these three types of loneliness at once. And it's, it's really tough. Yeah. So you mentioned Dr. Franco that you think that the loneliness might be showing up in ways that people are not recognizing. Can you tell us maybe what to look for? Like, how do we know if it's actually loneliness that we might be struggling with? So this is a really great question, Dr. Joy, because people think of loneliness just as like a sense of isolation. Like I haven't had company in a while, but it's actually a a feeling of social threat. And so what do I mean by that? Loneliness fundamentally alters how you perceive reality and how you perceive the world. So what the research basically finds is that when we're lonely, if you interact with a lonely person, they're more likely to dislike you after. Lonely people are more likely to be judgmental of other people. Lonely people are more likely to assume that other people are rejecting or criticizing them. Lonely people are ironically feel this sort of dual desires. One of the desires is like, oh, I feel the need to really connect with people. But another desire is actually the need to retreat from people. And the reason that's occurring is because when you're in this lonely state, you're under threat again. And you feel like if I talk to people, they might threaten me or they might reject me. And so because of this, we have these sort of competing desires when we're in a state of loneliness where we want to reach out to people. But actually, the hardest time to reach out to people is when you're in a state of loneliness because everybody feels so threatening to you. It feels almost like inevitable that if you reach out to people, they might reject you. And so because of all of those reasons, because of like these subtle ways that loneliness affect us, we might not necessarily understand that like, okay, this is my lonely brain speaking. I'm assuming that my friends don't want to hear from me. I'm assuming that my friends are going to reject me. I'm assuming things like nobody likes me. I'm, I'm going back to old memories that are negative in my relationships and I'm festering on them. I feel like withdrawing. I'm in a negative mood. All of those things we may not attribute to loneliness and we may not even notice. Like it's sort of like, um, you know, like the poison with no taste. It's happening to us, but we don't even know it's happening to us. And so as I've been reading the research and understanding this more deeply, there's been, you know, times where I'm just like, oh yeah, like I'm assuming that other people aren't going to want to hear from me. And, and actually I'm, I'm just in this bad mood and it's inexplicable and realizing and identifying that, oh, actually my loneliness can be playing a part in that. And I actually need social connection right now. And so, yeah, I, I just want to push us to just expand our understanding of what, how loneliness manifests for us so that we can be more aware of those times when we're feeling lonely. So, Dr. Franco, what you're sharing sounds very much like a hallmark depressive kind of symptom. And the idea of like a lot of the things that you know would actually help you to feel better, you maybe don't have the energy or the perspective to do. So I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. Did you say that somebody who's experiencing loneliness, if they meet someone, they might be less likely to like you afterwards? Well, there's two things. You will be less likely to like them. Lonely people actually like other people less. But the other thing is that when we're in our state of loneliness, you're in a state of self-protection, right? You're wanting to protect yourself from this threat. But how that manifests to other people around you is that you're sort of antisocial and you're Mm. withdrawn and and that you're mean. And Mm -hmm. what's actually happening is people are under threat. So they're closing off. So they're not being warm towards others. So they're not feeling genuine. They're not feeling like themselves. And so when you close off in that way because you're feeling threatened, what it comes off to 
to other people is that you're rejecting them and Mm -hmm. then you're vulnerable to continuing to that cycle of loneliness. Like it's like a virus that can spread from person to person because when we interact with those lonely people, they tend to reference themselves more. They tend to be a lot more absorbed with what's going on in their lives. They don't ask as many questions of their interaction partner. And so what we see playing out in these lonely states is really something called an egocentric bias. And egocentric bias is basically like, I'm so wrapped up in my pain that I don't understand that other people feel pain too, that other people are suffering too. And I'm taking everything to mean something personal about me and not considering the larger context of other people. Yeah, Dr. Franco. So this is mind blowing. I always love when you come with the new research (laughs) um, because... I don't know that this is something that we're always thinking about. And I feel like it would really be hard to know that this is what's happening for you. It is so hard. Like I've just been just learning. This is also like, I don't know, it's blown my mind. And and there's just been moments for me where I've just been like, really like understanding what it's like in those moments when I feel lonely. And I felt like I'm so desperate to reach out to someone to connect, but I'm so sure that if I do, they are going to reject me. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and I I can, you know, right now, now that I understand the research, I can be like, that's not true. This is my lonely brain speaking, but it feels so real to me because that's, that's what a lonely state veils us in. That's how the lonely state cloaks us. Mm -hmm. So of course we know a lot of maybe the lonely state has been kind of provoked by us having to shelter in place and maybe being more withdrawn from our support systems than we would usually. Are there other things that might lead to people feeling this way? Yes, certainly. So I think a point that I wanted to make too is that loneliness lives outside of us, right? When we don't get enough social contact, we're not interacting with people, but it also lives within us we carry the baggage of loneliness within us based on our past experiences. And what do I mean by that? You know, me, you, other people, we can all have the same stretch of like five hours where we're alone. Some of us are going to experience it as loneliness and some of us are not. And the question is, that's been answered a little bit by the research is, who is going to experience that alone time as an expanse of loneliness and who isn't going to experience it as maybe, oh, this is some time alone that I can enjoy. And it really depends on things like your self-esteem. Like the research shows that your self-esteem affects your feelings of loneliness such that if you have low self-esteem and you go through these periods of alone time, you're more likely to experience it as loneliness. Things like your mental health. If you have poor mental health and you're experiencing alone time, you're more likely to experience it as loneliness. And so our experiences of rejection, our experiences of neglect, our experiences of um, just negative social interactions that we carry with us inside of us and we project those into empty spaces of time where it feels like this emptiness, we fill it up with assumptions about people's rejection of us, even though nothing is actually happening and we're not actually interacting with people. And so I think, you know, in the process of getting over loneliness, we need to think about how do we tackle the loneliness outside of us through finding people to interact with? And also, how do we tackle the loneliness within us? How do we look deeply at the baggage that we carry that makes us feel that in those times when we're alone, we're suddenly flooded with all of these negative memories of negative experiences that we've had with other people. And so are there some thoughts about like how we start tapping into that? Yeah, certainly. Obviously we have therapy. I mean, I I think certainly therapy can make people feel less lonely, which is really, you know, ironic because it's this time outside of therapy when you're thriving more and you're feeling less lonely. There's also a few techniques that I've come across in the literature. One way is to turn your loneliness is into active solitude. So when people feel more control over their alone time, then it feels less lonely to them. So for example, if I'm like, oh, I have five hours of free time. I am going to watch YouTube and do a do-it-yourself video and this will be like my hobby time. Or yeah, if you turn it into like, this is my time to, you know, do my knitting or do my crocheting. If you turn it into like, this is like actual time that I'm going to use and that I feel in control of for some type of purpose, then you're going to feel less lonely. In terms of like also handling the loneliness that's inside of us, There's this interesting technique. It's called the third person. It's going to make you feel really goofy when you use it, but I think it's actually really effective. What's it called again, Dr. Franco? The third person? Third person technique, yeah. okay. So Mm -hmm. um, basically what you do is you talk to the third person. So if someone's going through loneliness, I might say like, 
Marissa feels really lousy right now. Marissa feels like no one wants to hear from her. Marissa feels so alone. And what that does is it actually, um, at the neurological level of your brain, your brain is being less triggered because you have separation from that emotional state. You are then in the state where you are watching the cloud of loneliness happening in your brain instead of just being a part of it and feeling it. So it feels goofy, but I actually want to encourage people to try it because it's a form of mindfulness. It's a way to use language to engage in mindfulness where like, instead of the threat overtaking you, you are now in a position to watch the threat that might be happening inside your body, separate yourself from it and feel less triggered by it. Mm. And I wonder if there's a part of the third person activity where you would also talk about like what the person might do to feel less lonely. Yeah. So I, maybe I turning it into idea. that purposeful action that you talked about in the first example. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, you know, it can certainly bring you to a state where you have more of the wherewithal to go and reach out to people because obviously that's ultimately what we want to do to cure our loneliness, reach out to people and connect. But it's again, like the hardest time to actually do that is when we feel loneliness because of all this ways that like loneliness and threat just hijacks our brain and mm-hmm. hijacks the assumptions out of the world. So I think the third person technique can also be a strategy for taking a step back and also being able to talk yourself through what you need to feel better, what you need to get out of this lonely state. So Dr. Franco, this might be perhaps a throwback to your first episode here, but I think a lot of people do really struggle with not necessarily having people to reach out to. So if they recognize the loneliness in themselves and they've done, you know, what you're telling them to do, but they realize like, who would I even reach out to? then what would be the suggestion there? Like if like a name or a list of names don't readily become available. Yeah. So I think now is actually a really good time to, I like to say, wake up your sleepy relationships Mm. (laughs) or rekindle old friendships. I think a lot of the time we know that from the research that the number one reason why friendships end is not because there was any sort of malice or resentment or a big fight or conflict. It was just, we fell out of touch. And so now we have more of that time to be intentional about reaching out to and being in touch with other people and setting aside that time to rekindle things. And so I think if you're finding yourself like, who can I reach out to? Who do I have to reach out to? Don't think about who you have right now. Think about who you've had throughout your entire life. And those are the types of people that you can wake up those relationships again. And I think when it comes to making friends, I really like the idea of rekindling old relationships because we're allowed to jumpstart the friendship process when we wake up an old relationship because we already have memories. We already have vulnerability. We already have time together. These are all of the things that deepens friendships and makes us more comfortable within them. And so I think that can be a really good idea for people that are just feeling like, oh, I feel so lonely, but like there's nobody I can talk to. That there's people, look back at at the timeline of your life. Who could you have talked to five years ago? Who could you have talked to when you're in college? and take the initiative to reach out and waken up those old relationships. And I want to be clear, you're talking about relationships that ended just because like we just stopped talking, not where there was active maybe boundary crossing or something actually happened. Yeah. We're talking about people that you just kind of like, oh, whatever happened to that person? <laughs> exactly. Good clarify. <laughs> <laughs> Got yeah. it. So something else that you mentioned that I think a lot of people kind of have this question Is there a difference between being alone and loneliness? Yes, yes. And that is just the emotional valence of the experience. So does it feel good to us or does it feel really bad and really negative to us? And so when our isolation is starting to feel bad and bring us into a bad mood, then it's going to be something that's more like loneliness. Mm. And I often hear people talking about having difficulty kind of just tolerating being alone. But I don't know if that's the same thing as loneliness or if that is something else at play. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that that could likely happen in a lot of different, for a lot of different reasons. Maybe one is loneliness, but maybe it's also like a um, not wanting to deal with something else or, you know, there could be some other emotional things going on for people who struggle with like tolerating their own company, so to speak. That's true. I mean, I I would just encourage people to like be curious about, you know, what's coming up for you when you're alone? What Mm -hmm. is, what is hard about it? What feelings are coming up for you? Are there memories that are coming up for you? Like what exactly is it about the alone time that is, that is getting to you? 
So it sounds like when you talked about like the definition and how like the lonely brain kind of tricks us, it sounds like it is really about the threat that we will be rejected or is the threat something else? I think that you're right, you know, on the money. It's this threat that we are going to be rejected. And I think what it becomes with loneliness is really this threat that we are rejectable. Like loneliness lowers our self-esteem. It lowers our sense of self-worth. And when it comes to overcoming loneliness, this is a technique that I forgot to share, but like in the research on, on psychological resilience, there's three things that make us resilient to situations. One is we don't personalize it. So we don't take it to mean I'm lonely because there is something wrong with me because I'm a horrible person because nobody wants to hang out with me. So if you can keep yourself from doing that, then you're going to be in a a better state. The other is prevalence. So prevalence is basically I'm lonely. So everything in my life sucks. My job sucks. My family sucks. It's like it's my loneliness is basically sinking into the nooks and crannies of everything about my life. And so if you can keep yourself from engaging in that, that prevalence and being like, okay, I'm lonely in this moment of time, it's going to pass. And there's also good things about my life, then that's great. The last thing for our psychological resilience is the idea of persistence. And that's the idea that I'm going to be lonely now and I'm going to stay lonely forever. And so when people believe that, it's a lot harder for them to bounce back from their experiences. So when it comes to in general, like trying to be resilient to difficult circumstances, loneliness being one of them, I want to encourage people to to do three things related to the three P's. And that's don't take the loneliness to mean that you suck or there's anything wrong with you or, you know, that you, you are deficient or, you know, that you aren't worthy. We are all lonely right now. The second thing is, even though you may be feeling lonely, there's also probably other things about your life that are going right, whether that's, you know, your health or your job, or you have a close friend or someone in your life that care about, that cares about you. And the other is really remembering this is not, you know, a persistent state. This is not our normal state. Feeling like you're going through a lot of loneliness right now doesn't mean that it's going to last forever. And at some point this is going to let up for us all. Oh, I love that. You know, I love a good alliteration. The three P's. (laughs) (laughs) The three P's. (laughs) So something else that I think um, I've heard community members talk about is feeling lonely, even in the midst of maybe being sheltering in place with their families. Can you speak to a little Mm -hmm. bit about that? Right. Because it's not like you wouldn't think like, oh, you have you're in a house full of people, but people still are experiencing loneliness. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. There's like there's definitely a strand, a thread of loneliness that is, you know, being loneliness around the company of others. And in some ways, I think that form of loneliness is even harder because when we see other beings, we assume that we're going to feel more connected or close to people. And so it's, it's this sort of contrast that reminds us, wow, I'm really lonely. Even though other people around me, I still feel lonely. And so I think there's this way that loneliness actually is a way of feeling misunderstood. Like being misunderstood is a form of loneliness. And as I delve deep into the research, Dr. Joy, I also realize that being out of touch with yourself, feeling inauthentic is also a lonely state. Like if you don't feel like you are in situations where you can express the truth of who you are, where you feel comfortable, where you feel like you're really you, like that lack of authenticity, that inauthenticity, like that's one of the ways that the sort of lonely in a crowded room phenomenon manifests for us. Mm, Yeah, it's likely, I mean, and it's likely some of that threat that you're talking about playing out, right? Like, can I really share this part of myself with these people, even though they're in my house together and I would expect that I could be close with them? Yeah, I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm sure, yeah, the lonely brain is probably not helping the lonely in a crowded room phenomenon. It's just, you know, it's just like depression where it's Mm -hmm. the real, the real sad part, the tragic part of it is like, not only is it a hard state to go through, but it literally takes away all of the resources that we have to get out of it. And Mm so that brings me to another tip for getting over your loneliness. Plan for your loneliness before you are lonely. So Mm. if you're like, my partner is going to be away this weekend. I am going to have a house to myself or, you know, I know that I tend to get lonely right before bed. When you're, it's during the daytime, when you're, you know, when you're, I don't know, having your Zoom calls and feeling a little bit more connected, put time in your schedule for later on when you're going to be lonely to find time to connect with people because 
when you're in the state of loneliness, the way that the lonely brain works, it's just going to make it really hard for you to reach out when you need it the most. So that's a really good point, Dr. Franco, and something that I think that is going to be unique about the time that we're living in now is that so many of us, I think, are just feeling so fatigued with the Zoom calls, right? Because yeah. it feels like you're on it for work, then we're on it for school, then we have yeah. to do our happy hours on Zoom, <laughs> right? Birthday parties on yeah. Zoom. And so I think it's for a so lot much. of people, it, it is so much, <laughs> so much, so much zooming. And yes. so I think, you know, for a lot of people, they're kind of like hitting a wall in terms of like, okay, if I have to do this for work, it feels like I really don't want to be on camera or on a call anymore to connect. Are there other things that you might suggest for people who are just kind of feeling fatigued with all of the, you know, zooming that we're having to do? There are a few things that I would suggest. I mean, I was reading this New York Times article and it was about how like Zoom actually fatigues us because of the the slowness and feedback makes it our brain use more energy to process other people's faces. We don't get the sort of automatic reaction from other people in the same way. And that like basically is very cumbersome for our brain. So even like switching to a phone call may be helpful. But one other point that I want to make is that you know, for me, I have my partner staying with me. I feel very lucky to have my partner with me, but we'll spend hours watching Netflix together and I will feel, I won't feel connected. Like it's, we're next to each other. We are sharing a couch, but we don't necessarily feel connected to each other. That's why I want to say um, that it's not necessarily about spending time with each other, but it's about how we connect. Like you want to connect in particular types of ways that make you feel close and connected to other people. And so even if that's over Zoom, it's going to make the Zoom a little less exhausting if you connect in particular types of ways that are deep and replenishing. And so I'm actually releasing a series on YouTube. It's called The Connection School, where I take people through like the different ways that you can connect more deeply. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But those are, um, those are things like just, I guess, for a sneak peak, like, um, being really vulnerable with people. If you're like talking to your friends and you're not actually sharing, if you're struggling with something or the, how hard this is for you, if you're trying to pretend that everything is all right right now, then you are robbing yourself of the ability to feel connected and to feel seen and also to get support, right? Because if people don't know you're going through something, then they're not going to be able to provide you with support. And so part of what I would recommend is like, so if you're not telling people how you're really feeling, You're robbing your relationships in two ways. One is the experiences of vulnerability makes us feel close to people. It makes us feel connected to people. It is what takes away our sense of loneliness. When we are more vulnerable, then you're more likely to get something out of an interaction that makes us feel more connected. And the other ways that it robs our relationships and our feelings of closeness is that if people don't know we're going through something, they're not able to support us. And getting that sense of support is also part of what makes us feel connected. And so what I really want to suggest to people is like, be really honest about your struggles with the people that you're close to right now. Like this is not the time to you know, try to pretend that everything is okay. The second thing that I want to just suggest to people is the power of reminiscing. And this occurred to me, I was talking to my friends, I I lived in Trinidad and Tobago, and we were talking about our our trip there and all the fun we had in Trinidad and Tobago. There's like parties into the morning and they're called like breakfast sets. And we're just reminiscing about all of that. And I just felt so good. And I realized that like, You don't have to travel physically. You can travel mentally too. Even though we can't leave our walls, we can travel across time by like reminiscing about different experiences with people. And when I looked into the research, it actually found that reminiscing is an effective intervention that has been found to combat loneliness, one thing. And the other thing that I found is reminiscing actually makes us more resilient to stress. So there was this interesting study where they had people stick their hands in ice cold water and then they were given the opportunity to reminisce and then um, they felt less cortisol, which is like the stress hormone that we all have. And so reminiscing makes us more resilient. And I think, you know, with the ways that this pandemic is probably affecting our mental health, I think it's a really good idea. And it is one way to feel more connected with people. Mm, I love that idea. Yeah. And I think that that is also an opportunity, like you mentioned, kind of rekindling quiet or sleepy relationships, right? Like that you start thinking about like, oh, remember when we had this experience, you know, hope you're doing well or something like that. Yeah, that's a great opportunity. Yeah, as an opportunity to kind of wake the relationship up a little bit. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) So are there other things that we haven't covered that you feel like are particularly important for people to know, especially right now? 
Oh yeah, there is one thing that I wanted to say too. And this is like the third method for for overcoming loneliness both within us and outside of us is the idea of focusing on others. Like honestly, what the research finds is that when we focus on others, it makes us less lonely. And it also finds that when we're lonely, we focus more on ourselves. And so being able to check in with other people, ask how other people are doing, or even do something kind for like your friends, like, I don't know, write them an email and, and ask them how you're doing or give them some sort of random acts of kindness. Like I sent my friend some, um, some ramen soup because I knew she was going through a lot. And so actually focusing on other people, like it takes the lens off of ourselves and it makes us feel more connected and it makes us feel less lonely. And it's also a way to kind of jump over the feelings of of like deep vulnerability and fear and mistrust that we have of others. Like we need to share ourselves, but we also feel like other people are going to, we're suspicious, we're more suspicious and paranoid about other people because of the lonely brain. And so I think a way to like overcome that is that if we just focus on other people and how they're doing, we don't have to go through that threatening process of finding a way to trust people, even when we're like overcome with the lonely brain. And so I think that's also a really great way to overcome your sense of loneliness, like just turn your attention to other people. And I think from a psychological perspective, it's something that I used to talk to clients who who recently went through breakups, because we know when we go through stressful experiences, what it does is it, it makes our lens on the world very tiny. We are completely absorbed in that experience of stress that we're under. And whether that's loneliness or whatever else it is, like that's what threat does to us. And so one way to get out of that sense of threat is we need to expand our world. We need to make our world look a lot larger. And usually that's a lot easier because I go to the gym in the morning. I go to work. I have all these different scenes throughout my day. It expands my world. It gets me out of the sense that my whole world is this one experience of stress. And so one way that we can sort of expand our world so that stress takes up a tinier portion of it, the loneliness takes up a tinier portion of it, is we focus on other people and we focus on being kind to other people and we focus on what we can do for other people. And I really love that approach because it not only tackles our own loneliness, but it tackles another person's loneliness. Like we're helping, we're we're doing two things at once to, to um, stave off loneliness. So I think if you're feeling lonely right now, ask yourself, like, what is something lovely and kind that I can do for another person? And that will help you too. I love that. I love that. I also think that it's a nice call to action for other people to make sure, you know, of course, we are all trying to survive this thing and, you know, try to be okay. But I also think that when you have the bandwidth, it is important to kind of think about Hmm, who in my circle haven't I heard from recently, yeah. right? Because what you've described is that people may need to reach out, but may have difficulty doing that right now. Exactly. So when you do have a little bit of bandwidth thinking about, okay, who haven't I heard from in a while? Who can I just let know that I'm thinking about them, which might then give the opportunity for somebody else to say, hey, I'm not feeling rejected because this person reached out to me. Exactly. Like knowing that is our motivation to check in on people even more. and. Um, You know, loneliness is contagious from one person to another, but so is joy. And Uh I think this is not a time to straight jacket your joy. Like if you are (laughs) feeling joyful, I send videos as to my friends like, hey, I'm in a good mood right now because of A, B, and C. Like this is a time to share your sense of joy because I think, you know, I bought a house through this whole process and I posted about it on Twitter and I was like, I don't know if I want to post about this because it feels like joy is like, I don't know, it's like um, disrespecting or blasphemous towards all of the sorrow. But I realized that like joy is not the opposite side of sorrow. You can experience both at the same time. And for me, this experience of joy was softening the blow of the sorrow instead of undermining it. And so I think like you can also like, I don't know, spread love, spread affirmation. If you're in a good mood and you feel like I'm feeling so much love for my friend right now, like tell them, like spread that out throughout your network. I love it. I love that, Dr. Franco. So you mentioned that the YouTube series is starting. Is the first episode up now or is there somewhere we can like be ready to follow? Yes. um, You can look up Dr. Marissa G. Franco as YouTube for My Connection School. It's going to take you to a few weeks that you could spend with your friends and activities that you can do to deepen your relationship. And um, I also have a newsletter. Uh, So if you go to drmarissagfranco.com, you will find, you'll be able to sign up for my newsletter. I, I share if you're fascinated or as I am in the research on connection, then you'll get a little bit of it every month. Um, you can follow me on Instagram or on Twitter, Dr. Marissa G. Franco, D-R-M-A-R-I-S-A, G. 
T-F-R-A-N-C-O. And yeah, I just wanted to send like empathy and love to everybody right now. And, you know, remind you if you're feeling lonely, it's, it's, it's not you. And I, I just really hope that some of these, these tips and tricks and these understandings can really help folks deal with something that feels so inevitable, but is such an act of love to like distance ourselves from other people right now. Absolutely, Dr. Franco. And of course, we will include all of that in the show notes. Are there any other books or resources you would suggest people to check out related to this? Yeah, so there's a new book called, I think it's called Together. I think it's his name is Vivek Murphy. He was like the, uh, oh, the, the uh, Surgeon General. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read his book. I think he has a lot of good and helpful insights on like staying connected at this time. So I would, write, I would add that to my list from okay. my last episode. Okay, perfect. Yes. And like I said, if you missed her first episode, then this is a perfect time to go back and listen to that one because you shared lots and lots of great information. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank (laughs) you again for joining us today, Dr. Franco. I really appreciate it. Always happy to be here. I'm so glad Dr. Franco was able to join us again this week. Don't forget to visit the show notes at therapyforblackgirls.com slash session 156 to get connected to Dr. Franco's YouTube page or to check out the resources she shared. And please share your takeaways with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. And don't forget to share this episode with others in your life who might enjoy it. If you're looking for a virtual therapist in your area, be sure to check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic and connect with some other sisters in your area, come on over and join us in the Yellow Couch Collective, where we take a deeper dive into the topics from the podcast and just about everything else. You can join us at therapyforblackgirls.com slash YCC. Don't forget to show our sponsors some love by going to helixsleep.com slash therapyforblackgirls to get up to $200 off your mattress order and two free pillows. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon. Take good care. <laughs>